opportunity that you've given us to gather around your scripture. Lord, we do this because we believe that it is a supernatural time that you use to especially edify your saints and equip your people. We also believe that this is a special time that your spirit uses to convict us of sin, to root out transgression in our life on a weekly basis, uh, to bring us to penitence regarding that sin which we've committed. And so, Father, uh, we confess to you as a people a few things. First of all, Lord, we confess to you as the Fellowship Baptist Church corporately that we are not righteous by ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would just wash away our self-righteousness like a shower this morning, that you would let not a drop uh, not a drop stain us, that we not have that stench of self-righteousness in and of our own deeds, but only carrying that which has been given to us by Christ through faith. Lord, we believe that the scripture is inerrant and it is inspired and uh, it is sufficient and it's authoritative over us. And Lord, that being the case, I pray that you would bless its preaching. Let it be used in a way that would glorify you and accomplish your will in our lives and bless us for having heard it. Lord, I pray that people would listen as intently as intensely as the word itself is preached, that the listening to your your preaching of scripture, Father, would be as genuine and, and heartfelt as the preaching and that you might be glorified by that. Lord, we pray for limited distractions today that you would attune our hearts to what is heard, and that you would give us ears to hear it in a spiritual way. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of 1 John is written so that we can know that we have eternal life. You say that you know Christ. You claim to be a Christian. Most of you in the room, anyway, can say, I believe that I'm a Christian. A few of you might say, honestly, I don't really know if I'm a Christian or not. This book is written for those of you who do not know if you have faith because it lets you know whether or not your faith is genuine. It is also written for those of you who do know that you have faith so that your faith may be strengthened. Finally, this book is written for those who falsely think they have faith when in fact they do not. And this book should be able to root out in your life if that's the case, if that's the scenario, if you're one of many millions of people on the earth walking around thinking that you have the, re- the religion of Jesus Christ when in fact you don't have the religion of Jesus, let alone a relationship with him. And so we're going to start in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, the passage that Brother Paul read for us. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Let me stop there uh, just for a moment. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Now, what does that mean, makes a practice of sinning? And if you read a different version, it may say continues to sin, but I like the way that it's phrased here in the, in the ESV because it makes a better sense of the verb tense that is used, which clarifies in Greek something more precisely than the verb tense that is used in English. This term, continue to sin, uh, is better understood by us perhaps as makes a practice of, makes a practice of sinning. This is not implying that the believer has no sin that they might on occasion commit, because if that's what John meant, he was contradicting what he had written in the first chapter of this epistle. That if anyone says that they have no sin, they're a liar, and God's truth is not in them. This is not talking about uh, what we might refer to as sinless perfection. The notion that once someone is born again, that they'll never sin ever again. There are very few people on the planet who believe in the concept of sinless perfection, and that is because most people are even vaguely self-aware. That they themselves have sinned, continue to sin, they're aware of others, they see others sin. This notion is not that if you are a believer, you never sin. The, The truth here can be found in the details. He who practices sin. This is someone who has made an effort even to get better at sin. They sin and they plan on sinning. 
They're fine with sin. They're comfortable in sin. They have no intention to repent of sin. This is not descriptive of an individual who finds themselves in sin, stops, repents, and then may sin again. This is referring to someone who sins, is comfortable with it, sleeps well at night, makes no plan to repent, has no desire to stop, and they continue in that sin. That's what this word means, or the phrase, makes a practice of sin. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, and then this wonderful, simple definition of sin. Here it is. Sin is lawlessness. Now, it's important to understand the definition of sin just as it's important to understand so many different definitions in Scripture. And the easier we can understand a term or the more simply defined, the better it is for us. Sin is very simple. Sin is lawlessness. Now, when I was a kid in church, they taught me the definition of sin was missing your mark. A legend about firing an arrow and not hitting the bullseye. And, and that is uh, that missing the mark, not being perfect, is what sin is. But to a young person trying to clearly define what is and is not sin, that was actually more difficult for me to understand. What does it mean that I'm not perfect? You might have even asked someone, Do you, like, have you sinned? And they're like, well, I'm not perfect. What does that mean? Like, have you... Have you committed this crime or this sin? You can ask some people directly, have you done this thing? And instead of answering the question, they say, well, I'm not perfect. Well, you're not, you're not clear either. Like, why are you being so vague? Well, nobody's perfect. It, it's a hard way for me to understand. Okay, so if sin is anything less than hitting the mark, what is God's mark might be the next question. Where am I supposed to land here? And so the Bible gives several different definitions of sin. All of them are adequate because, of course, they come from the Scripture. I'll give you a few examples. First of all, the Scripture says that which ever does not, or that which does not proceed from faith is sin. So that which you do, which does not come through faith, is in and of itself sin. And so sin is tied up in a heart of unbelief. So that's, that's part of the definition of sin. It's because if we truly believe God, we would obey God. And so every time we sin, it is a recognition that we do not believe him as much as we ought to believe him. It also implies that doing the right thing for the wrong reason is still actually the wrong thing. And, and let me give you an example. If someone were to take care of starving AIDS babies and the orphans and feed the hungry and clothe the naked, but they did it to earn their own righteousness and to get brownie points with God, it's actually sin, the scripture would teach. It's sin because they did the right thing, but it was out of the wrong motivation, and so that doesn't count. It's kind of like if you give your clothes to goodwill, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that you do, but if you do it only to get the charitable receipt... It's only done so that you have a tax break. Then actually, it's no longer charity. It's selfishness. Do you understand that? That's how motivations work. So if you, if you do the right thing, but for the wrong reason, if it doesn't proceed out of a heart of faith, then it's rejected by God. But I, I'm a person who thinks very much in black and white, and I need a clear definition as to what is sin and what is not sin so that I know. And I think most people uh, need that clear definition as well because most people would look at you and say, I'm imperfect, I have sinned, but not have a clear grasp of what that sin is. Thankfully, this passage is incredibly clear as to the nature of sin and how it is correctly defined so we know what it is that we need to repent of. And it says very clearly, sin is lawlessness. And what law is it referring to? The law that it is referring to is the moral law of God. The law that has always been in force, the law that is in force now, the law that always will be enforced. 
The law of God, his moral law that we find in his Ten Commandments, are nothing but a reflection of the righteous attributes of God. The law reflects who God is. If you want to know God's righteousness, look at his Ten Commandments. These things reflect the nature and the attributes of God. And when God gave his law in Exodus chapter 20, when he wrote them in his own finger upon tablets of stone, he was not giving the Jewish people anything new. He was telling them what they already should have known. Long before God said, thou shalt not murder, Cain was still held responsible for murdering Abel. Long before God said, thou shalt not steal, he held Adam and Eve accountable for taking uh, a fruit from the tree that did not belong to them. And so these things have always existed. What God did for us because he loves us was write it down. And in case it couldn't get any clearer that the law of God was meant to be permanent, he didn't write it on parchment, but he carved it into stone to clarify its permanency. Morality is not situational. That which is right has always been right, and that which is morally wrong has always been morally wrong. Not only do we as Christians believe that, that, that ethics and morality do not change from decade to decade, we don't even think that it changes from millennia to millennia. The reason why morality does not change is because God's law is written in stone. And it does not change. The reason why God's law does not change is for one very important reason. If you get this, you'll understand how God's law works. God's law is a reflection of him. And God is immutable, unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, in order for something to change from right to wrong or from wrong to right, God himself would have to change. And that will not happen. And so as it says here, sin is lawlessness. He's referring to a violation of the law of God, the moral law. And thankfully for us, it is summarized in the Ten Commandments. It is reiterated throughout the New Testament. Some might quibble at this point and say, well, this is referring to the law of Christ. Now I'd ask the question, was the law that Christ obeyed any different than the moral law of God? Was it any different than the Ten Commandments? So if you, if you live a life like Jesus, you will live a life that is in obedience to God's commandments, to the moral law. And that's what sin is, clearly defined. Have you ever had anyone approach you with sin? It happens to all of us, right? And you want to know specifically. Please let me know specifically what I did wrong and what I can improve upon and how I can fix that. And so God, knowing that's how our mind works, does just that. And so if we are trying to not let our light be hid under a a bushel, if we are trying to let our candle and our light shine before men, and we have a message as Christians, as the Fellowship Baptist Church, we have a message. Jesus Christ can save you from the the wrath of God incurred on account of sin. If you would just repent of your sin and believe the gospel, it's really on us then to have to define what sin is to know whether or not or for someone to know whether or not they should repent of it, yes? So we have to define what is sin. So let's go through that quickly when it says lawlessness. And by the way, I would point out that the apostles frequently refer back to the law of Moses as they address sin. Paul does it in Ephesians 5. It's done all throughout the scripture. The New Testament apostles were still referring to God's moral law and the law of Moses to speak of sin. And so let's do that. And let me ask you as I begin, as I go through these list of 10 commands, I want you to answer the question, does any of this seem unreasonable to you? Because when we approach people with a list of commandments that God has given, they are prone to say, first of all, whoa, you got ten of them? (laughs) Ten whole commandments? That seems like a lot. Well, if it helps, Jesus summarized them by two commandments, 
which is to love God and to love neighbor. But if you are to know how to love God and how to love your neighbor, he's given you ten commands for you to know how that works. But we come across as being school marms with a long list of things to follow and possibly even some outrageous commands that we're to obey. So you tell me if they sound at all outrageous. Commandment number one, have no other gods besides him. He is, after all, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the one and only creator. He's the one who made the universe by the flexing of his anthropomorphic vocal cords, and ex nihilo, out of nothing, made all things. There are two categories of things that exist in the universe. Two categories. There's that which is made, and there is he who who has made it. That's it. Everything else in all creation exists in one of two categories. It is either created or it is the creator. One of two categories. Matter, created, and then there's the one who created it. Time is relative. E equals mc squared. Time and space created things. God created it. What about things that don't exist, things that we have made up? Well, there are your brain cells that put these things together to create something that we call thoughts, but there's the one who made that, God. There are created things, and there is the creator. If you have any other God besides the creator, it is a wrong God and a false God. So you are to only have one God, one God. And have no other gods before him. And what that means is everything is before him. He sees all after all. So it is laid out before him. Have no other gods. And in the positive expression of that commandment, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's put this way. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Does that seem unreasonable to love God as much as he deserves to be loved? Chiefly by not worshiping other gods? which by definition have to be dumb, deaf, blind, non-existent figments of our imagination and manufactured things made by our own hands? That seems common sense. Second commandment, don't make graven images, whether of God or of your false gods. Both. He is the one true God. The scripture says he is in invisible light. We cannot possibly reflect his image through art in a way that does him glory. The greatest artistic representations of God that you have ever seen, like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, or Da Vinci's Sistine Chapel, whoever, that to God looks like, uh, as I used the example in Sunday school this morning, a monkey with finger paint trying to explain by art the glory and the majesty of God. Like you draw God as a naked old man with a beard in the heavens, touching fingers with some other... You fall, have fallen so far short of who God is. I mean, think about it this way. What we consider to be good art is only a semi-decent reflection of what the real is, yes? So when you look at a, a painting by Thomas Kincaid of a sunset, we'd say that's good art. What makes that good art? It kind of, sort of, looks like what God does every single moment that the globe turns all over the world, day in, day out, as the sun sets on the world that God made by speaking it into creation. And here comes a chimpanzee, slightly, slightly of of a higher IQ, who is writing, or drawing rather, a picture of what God has done, and we say, that's impressive. It's just a reflection of what God has done. The closest that we can do to bearing God's image is not by art, but it's by us. That's the closest that we can get to the image of God. And how far short do we fall of that? So don't make images of God. Throw out your baby Jesuses. You don't need them. Take Jesus off the cross. Don't image God and don't make false little idols representing some other kind of God. We don't need those things in our life. 
It's insulting to him. The example I've given you before is, is of children drawing our picture. And they draw the family. And they have mommy stick figure and bubby stick figure and another sissy stick figure. And then dad, it's like a circle. And I'm, I should... Thank you. Um, what you, you got to put it on the fridge at least until they turn around, right? What, it's not exactly a flattering photo. Do you understand? The greatest image ever made to represent the glory of God falls far more short than a stick figure you. What reflects God is his people glorifying him in a genuine act of worship. So don't have pictures that you shouldn't have, images. And furthermore, even in your imagination, think of God as he is in this book, not as you would like him to be. Third commandment, don't misuse his name. The scripture says it's his name above all names. The scripture says that by that name, if we confess that name as Lord, we'll be saved. The scripture says whoever shall call upon his name will be saved. And his name is Yeshua in the Hebrew. It means Savior. Jesus in Greek. Jesus. It means Savior. Why would you take the name Savior and misuse it? Or God's name and misapply it? This means not saying his name as an expletive. Like if... Instead of saying a four-letter filth word, you would replace it with God's name? I've explained to you before, the quickest and surest way to get your friends to stop doing that is to ask their mother's name and then promptly use it every time you get upset. They'll learn very fast upon their personal offense that you not use someone's name as an, explicit, as an expletive to express disgust and then explain to them that Jesus Christ and God Almighty are much more important to the universe than their mother. It is like the dog who bites the hand who feeds it. God's given you everything. He's given you the air that you breathe, the lungs that take in the air, the blood that flows through your veins, and the heart that pumps the blood. He's given you a mind. He's given you taste buds. He's given you hands and feet and fingers. He's given you senses like smell and sight and sound. Literally, like the dog who bites the hand trying to feed it is the person who uses God's name in vain. So respect his name and don't misuse it. The fourth commandment, honor the Lord's day. Remember it and keep it holy. He's given six days a week to get all of your business done. Now keep in mind, in God's eternal system of judgment, he could kill you in your sleep and he would not be wrong for it because the wages of sin is death. So every moment, or rather every morning, that you open your eyes and you get to suck in air is a moment that God has been gracious to you. And yet, he's given you six days to get your recreation done and to get your work done and to get your laundry done and to do your traveling and to go here and there six days and you weren't entitled to a single one. And one day, God said, belongs to him. And get this. On the day that God says belong to him, belongs to him, he's given us two primary tasks. The first one is that we worship and that we not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but all the more as the day draweth near, we come together in assembly and worship. Uh, there are worse places than this on the earth. We go to them about six days a week. It's called work. You know how they say when you're fishing, you know a bad day fishing is better than any day working. A bad day in the house of God is better than any day where I'm not there. I mean, it's where the saints are gathered. And, and then the rest of the day, we are to use for rest and to restore ourselves physically. This part of the day is to restore ourselves mentally and to restore ourselves emotionally 
and to restore ourselves spiritually. The rest of the day, we keep doing those things, but we're also resting to restore ourselves physically. So get this. It's not as though God, a perpetual narcissist, just says, take a day and just celebrate me the whole day. We do celebrate him the whole day, but we celebrate him the whole day and we worship him by doing something that he commands that's good for us. How loving is that, that God says, no, 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 this day is special. It's mine. Do what I tell you to do on this day. I've given you six. You can use any way that you want. I've given you one day. I want you to do what I tell you to do on this one day. If he stopped there, we should all stop immediately and do exactly what our king requires. Amen? Do exactly what our king requires. Because he didn't have to give me a single day. He gave me six. He gets whatever he wants on the Lord's day. And what does he command of us? Take a nap. Praise God. We have a Lord who is so good. I haven't even made up my mind as whether or not dietine is allowed on the Sabbath. I have to fully think that out. But I know that God has given us one day where he says, just rest. Worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Beloved, I know you people. I, like, I know you stay stressed out, some of you. I know, that you're, I know that you're worried. I know that some of you have a lot of stress. Let me quote to you the words of Christ from the Sermon on the Mount. Is, tomorrow, if, is tomorrow's stress is not sufficient? Like, are we, are we not? Every day we wake up, is the worry for that day not sufficient unto itself? Can you not put off tomorrow's stresses until tomorrow? Worry about it tomorrow. This is the Lord's day. Christ Jesus rose from the dead. We're celebrating this. I got a lot of stuff to do Monday. And I had a lot of stuff to do yesterday. God's stuff is done today. And so it's not that unreasonable. It's, it's, it's just rest, worship, and then also throw in some feasting into that. And it's for our good. Does it seem draconian yet? Right? When you're a toddler and someone wants you to take a nap, you throw a fit. Then you go to college and you're like, I just, I just want a nap. And then you have children and you're like, I can't wait to retire just so I can have a nap. I've forgotten what one is like. And yet that which you did do, kicking and screaming, you now look at and say, what a privilege and blessing and honor that is. Now, when I explain a Sabbath lifestyle to people, and I say, yeah, sometimes I stay up till midnight on Saturday night to get stuff done that I need to get done on Sunday. And sometimes I put, like, I, I put stuff off, maybe borderline irresponsibly, until Monday morning. But Sunday is reserved for the Lord. That means I just, unless I find it relaxing or restorative uh, in some capacity, I just don't do it. Can you believe that the majority of the world looks at us as Christians in our Sabbath lifestyle and they're like, that seems really harsh. It seems really hardcore. That's a lot. It seems like a lot. Right, day off. It's a horrible life. My cosmic employer gives me a day off. God tells me to rest. Doesn't seem that horrible. What about the fifth commandment? Hopefully all of us can agree with this one. Honor your mother and father. Honor your mother and father. And, and the, the fourth commandment says that your days may be long on the earth that the Lord thy God has given you. And it's referring not to a long life physically, because of course we know the good sometimes die young, but it's referring to the covenant land, the promised land that God has promised the people. And he's saying you will remain in the faith. Your children will remain in the faith if you teach them to honor and to obey you. There will come a time in your child's life in which they would be prone to stray from the Lord and the only thing that keeps them in the house of God is that you've ingrained in them to obey their mother and father. Then, by God's grace, they will grow up to the point where they realize that they should obey their father in heaven and not just their father on earth. 
but an amazing amount of bad decisions are avoided because we teach our children to honor your mother and father in the Lord. As Paul would say, honor your mother and father in the Lord, for this is the first commandment, because he's going off of a list of ten. That's why he says first. This is the first commandment with a promise. It doesn't seem unreasonable. Honor your mother and father. Uh, sixth commandment, do not murder. Does it seem overly complicated? Hopefully not. And yet, Jesus said that if you're angry with your brother, like in an unjust sort of way, then you've committed murder in your heart already. The question is not just what you have done, but what you would do if you could get away with it. And all of us, I believe, in the right time and in the right place, get, given the correct circumstance, are capable of killing someone. If you don't think you're capable of killing someone, you've never been close to the right circumstance or the right situation. It's a good thing God restrains us. But that attitude that you get in traffic when someone is going so slow and you're pounding on the steering wheel and you're angry and screaming at them and that vein on your forehead begins to bulge, you understand that's the feeling that other less controlled people feel right before they strangle someone to death. It comes out of that same place in the heart of irrational anger and rage because the sinner will look at you very boldly and say things like, well, God judges my heart, right? And your heart is murderous, even though your hands aren't. Seventh commandment, don't commit adultery. And Jesus defined this as even looking at a woman with lustful intent is committing adultery in your heart. Do you understand that to God, it doesn't matter what you have done sexually it also matters to God what you would do if you could get away with it and not have consequences. What man in this room could not be classified in God's sight as a whoremonger? It's not just what you have done, it's what you would do if you could get away with it and not have consequences. It's about what you've thought about doing. It's about what you would like to do. And just as every man is prone to lust, I believe that, that every woman is prone to adultery in the right circumstance, in the right situation, in the right environment, without the proper care, without the proper, without the proper space. Not necessarily more so than a man. My point is, women are not absolved from this commandment either, right? We're all capable of falling into this sin that Jesus gets to define as sin. Sometimes people quibble with me at that point, and they say, well, I'm, are, you, like, are you saying that lusting uh, after someone is the same as adultery? And my response is, no, I'm not saying that. Jesus said that. I don't have to say that. To, to some extent, it is different. There is a category distinction because one is physical and one is mental, but the point is it all comes from a heart that is sinful. It comes from a heart that is adulterous. The problem is not just the outside of the cup, but the inside. And we're fundamentally broken at that point. The Eighth Commandment, don't steal. Don't take what is not yours. We think that one's common, and when I take someone through the commandments, this is the commandment that most people, if they say they haven't broken one, is the one they say they haven't broken. I haven't stolen anything. I think especially among certain cultures, it's especially bad to be considered a thief. So what's weird is I've had people break the, they, they've informed me, I've broken the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh commandment, but I've never stolen anything. Uh, when you worship some other god, whose glory did you steal? When you broke the Sabbath day, whose day did you steal? When you slept with another man's wife, did you not take something that did not belong to you? What is murder if it is not theft of a life? This is why James writes that if we've broken one of God's commandments, we've broken them all. They're all tied together, you see. That's theft in its greatest sense. If we begin to think of sin in this category, then we understand that these commandments encompass every part of our life. 
One of the illustrations that I like to give to demonstrate this is the story of two men on on the side of the road. One is sitting there and he is impoverished and he is broke. He has not a dime to his name. He appears to be very disabled. He is what you would call a beggar, a transient, you know, the cardboard sign, will work for food. The man has nothing. Coming down the road is another man, older, hobbling along but he appears to be well off. The two men talk, and the wealthy man takes pity on the beggar, and he knows that he has nothing of his own, and so he takes some coins out of his pocket, and he counts them, one, two, three, four, five, and he gives the coins to the, to the poor man, and he says, I'm, I'm going to reserve one for myself. I, I, I mean, I, I need some left. I'm, I've got the rest of my journey to go, but you can take the rest. And, and that poor man who deserved nothing and was entitled to nothing was appreciative at first, but then he got to thinking about it that he would like the seventh and the final coin. And so he got up, not that crippled after all, and chased after the wealthy man, the older gentleman, and pushed him down and accosted him and stole his last and final coin. Robbed him of it. Now, if you were on a jury for that man, what kind of punishment would you give? You ungrateful beggar. And yet, this is the story of Sabbath breaking. God gave us six days. We weren't entitled to a single one. And in a heart of ingratitude, we said, you know what, I kind of want this day also. I'll take it for myself. When we look at it in terms of theft... In the Eighth Commandment, we realize exactly the depth of that sin and how it qualifies. Ninth Commandment, don't bear false witness. Don't say things that are not true. You know, certain words, certain terms just bother me just because I know that words are important. And for the Christian, there is something about untruth that should, it should bother us. And, and listen, regardless of political party affiliation, if you see someone constantly lying every day, listen, that should bother you. Amen? That should bother you. You shouldn't like to hear something that's, you know, fundamentally is not true. One of those words that really annoys me is misgender. It's a lying word. Because what misgender means is to appropriately gender someone. And yet the word itself is violating the ninth commandment. It is a lie. The word itself lies. There should be something in the Christian that says, we, listen, God is truth, and therefore we should tell it. We should speak true things. And then the tenth commandment. Don't covet what's not yours. You know, coveting is basically lusting after possessions. By the way, It can also go back to the Eighth Commandment, yes? Coveting that which does not belong to you, whether it is your neighbor's wife or whether it is your neighbor's donkey or any other such thing. So the Seventh Commandment prohibits lust of people, but the Tenth Commandment prohibits lust of possessions. In this case, the man's wife is his possession, which is why she's listed there. It's not just a woman. It's his wife. She doesn't belong to you. His stuff does not belong to you. What is the sin there? It's the sin of ingratitude. God has given you everything you could ever want or need. He's given you everything you've got. And yet you look at what someone else has done and you say, I want that. Imagine working really hard to buy that appliance that your wife wanted, a new stainless steel stove, and you got her the exact one that she wanted, and She wasn't even expecting it, but you worked overtime. You got a bonus. You worked hard. You provided it. You installed it. She came home. She was surprised, and the first thing out of her mouth was, I wish we had a fridge to match. You'd say, well, okay, me too, but woman, can you not not say thank you and enjoy, just bake a pie first before you complain about the fridge? Let me, show me that you know how to use it. This is not an example for my life, by the way. But you say, show me that you, like, be grateful in, in what you have. People, God has given you so many blessings, you could not live a hundred lifetimes to stop and enjoy them all. 
How many of you are really wringing the pleasure and the joy out of your children like you should? I don't. I could live a hundred lifetimes and never properly enjoy my children. I could live a hundred lifetimes and never properly enjoy sunsets and sunrises. I could live a hundred lifetimes and never enjoy yawning and sneezing as much as I should. Simple things that God has given. And yet we want more and more and more to the point that we want things, we want to accumulate things for ourselves that we can't even use. It's like Jay Leno's garage. Look at all the cars we have. You don't even have time to drive them, man. Where's the enjoyment in that? I could spend a thousand years and never finish the books in my office. I have so many blessings, I can't even soak in, and yet we still want what other people have. Buy one thing and immediately start wanting someone something else. Okay, so then, there's God's law. I just described it for you. Have no other gods. Don't make dumb images or idols that you're going to bow down and worship with your hands or anything that reflects his image. Don't misuse his name. Honor the Sabbath day. It belongs to God. Use it for his glory and for your benefit. Obey your mother and father. Don't murder people. Don't lust or commit adultery. Don't, don't, uh, don't steal. Don't lie. And don't be an ungrateful coveter. How much of that sounds unreasonable? Every sin we could ever commit is a violation of one of those two command, ten commandments. And ultimately, it's a violation of one of two. We either didn't live, love God as much as we should, because if we did, we wouldn't break the first four commandments, or we don't love our neighbor as much as we should, breaking one of the last six commandments, dealing with our neighbor. So it's, it's that simple. How much of that is unreasonable? So then back to the text. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It's simply someone saying, I know what the law is, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. That's a lawless person, a law breaker. Verse 5, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Now, he says this in verse 5. I like the way he phrases it because he's presuming by this point that he's speaking mostly to Christians. You know, he says, you know that he appeared to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. I may have to stop there for the sake of time, but as a matter of fact, it would probably be good because in, the, in this verse is the fullness of the gospel. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. What he's getting at is, and we'll have to flesh this out more in coming weeks, but what he's getting at is, the person who practices sinning, who's trying to get better at it, who's not repenting of it, that, that person is clearly not saved because if they were in God, there's no sin. They would become more like God, not, not less like him. That, that said, what does it mean that he came to take away sins? The doctrine is called the doctrine of expiation expiation. Now, most of you catechized students, knows, most of you know what the word propitiation is, yes? What does propitiation mean? It means wrath quencher, right? Wrath absorber. That Jesus got on the cross, he was nailed there, he was imputed with our sin, and then after being imputed with the guilt of the sin of all believers, God the Father crushed him and, and punished him taking out his wrath upon Jesus, who just stood there like the Son of God, absorbing it. He took the blows. He took the punishment. He propitiated the wrath of God so that when God sees you, he no longer desires to punish you because he has desired Christ or punished Christ instead of you. You get propitiation, right? And that is the gospel. Here's what the word expiation means. It means to take away. So not only does Christ propitiate the wrath of God, but he expiates sin 
from us. Expiation is very important for a couple different reasons. Number one, understanding expiation is important to knowing uh, that God has not only forgiven you, but he has removed the sin from you. It's no longer on you. I'm going to tie it in with the second way or reason expiation is important, and that is because sin can make you feel guilty and dirty even though you weren't the one who committed it. And expiation is important not only to remove the guilt of sin you've committed, but the stain of guilt that may be your feeling even though you haven't committed it. So let me use a horrific example, but it's the best one to convey my point. Uh, Sometimes you might have seen it portrayed on television or in the movies, a woman being violently taken advantage of uh, by surprise. And so the first thing she does is take a shower. What's she trying to do? She's trying to expiate that, that grossness from her. She did nothing wrong. She's innocent, and yet she feels dirty. You with me? She still feels the guilt of that that rape or that molestation. She still feels it hanging on her head, and no matter how much she cleans, she still still feels that. Beloved, sin does that for us and to us and also to the ones that we sin against. Sin leaves a stain a blot, and it, it, it's over us. If you've ever made a fool of yourself because of alcohol, you know what it's like to live with that stain, that stigma. If you were once known as a promiscuous woman or man, that stain can follow you around. If you've ever made a complete fool of yourself or had your name show up in the paper for having been arrested or had a mental health issue or for whatever reason, if you were known as being a rebellious youth, whatever that is, that leaves a stain or a stigma on you that it's hard to live down. But here's what Jesus did. He came to remove, to expiate that sin from us. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me clean again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So it removes not only the sin, having punished it, it removes its guilt from the, the, the guilt of the transgression altogether from us so that we can say, yeah, I have sinned. I've broken God's laws I am an offender before God, but now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. I'm reminded of a brother one time who went to prison after having been converted, still had to make amends and provide sort of a temporary atonement for his sin in prison. And uh, the psychologist in the prison was very concerned about him because when they asked if he felt guilty for his offenses, he said no. Now, it wasn't a crime against people, but I don't suppose that matters much. He just said no. And they're like, well, our job is to make you feel guilty over it. And he explained to them Romans 8.1. He quoted to them the scripture. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. I can't feel guilty over that because Christ Jesus took that guilt from me. He wasn't saying he wasn't guilty. Like He was trying to get them to understand, I'm absolutely guilty. You're asking me how I feel. I feel as though I've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ paid for my sin. I feel as though I've been forgiven for that. By the way, he spent about six months longer in prison than he was supposed to because they kept demanding that he feel guilty over his sin and he kept preaching to them the gospel. Beloved, for the Christian trying to think about whether or not we know God, if we, if we continue to practice sin, like if we're comfortable with it, we're living with it, you, you don't know God. Sin is a violation of all of God's laws. And when I just went through the Ten Commandments today with you, you might have thought to yourself, hopefully, I've broke that one, broke that one, broke that one, broke that one, broke that one. If that makes you feel condemned, good. 
But we have one who came to take away that condemnation. And he paid for every last one of those sins. That's good news. Father, thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your law that is so explanatory as to what sin is, that we can't miss it. But thank you for a Savior who paid for every last one of those sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Paul.